Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 28 and verse 58. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are, of all people, most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits. Then, when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, It is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you because you are good and you are gracious to give us your word, to give us your truth, to give us your very self. I pray that as we reflect on this passage that your gospel and your grace would be clear to your people despite my own inadequacies. Lord, we pray that we would be built up in every way into Christ who is our head and our savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My soul wants something that's new, that's new. My soul wants something that's new. This is the chorus of an anonymously composed hymn that emerged from communities of African slaves in the South. It's cataloged in a hymn book of Negro spirituals under the category of sorrow songs. My soul wants something that's new. They were songs that emerged from the horrors of slavery and related abuses. The verses of the song, which I haven't repeated for you, they beautifully reflect on Christ's suffering and the reality of his amazing grace, but they don't yet touch on the resurrection because there was a kinship with the sufferings of Christ. And it was a kinship that pointed to the chorus the longing for something else, for something new, something beyond the sorrow of Christ's suffering and death. You know, there's something haunting about that refrain, something that connects with the soul longing in each of our hearts, something that's always there but probably closest to the surface for each and every one of us when we have experienced suffering or grief. Our souls long for something that's new, for something better than death, for something eternal, for resurrection life. Today we bring to a conclusion our series um, on what it means to be made by God, 
as human beings, how we can live and flourish in the goodness of God's design. And I've enjoyed this journey with all of you. I've enjoyed the reflections I've had throughout the weeks on what it means to be made in God's image. But today, we move to the last part of it, what it means to be made for eternity. What is our eternal hope, and why does it matter? And my message for you today is that our hope for eternity, and it's a little bit different than what's in your bulletin, my hope, our hope for eternity, it's fixed on the restoration that comes from sharing in Jesus' resurrection. Our hope for eternity is fixed on the restoration that comes from sharing in Jesus' resurrection. Sharing in Jesus' resurrection is our eternal hope. Today, rather than follow the pattern we have each and every week of this series, looking at our subject through the biblical story of creation, our created design, our experience of sin and corruption in this world in the fall, redemption in Christ, and then restoration, we're going to do something a little bit different. We'll just be looking at the last item in the list, our restoration hope, where we're moving towards as God's people. And we're going to look first at what it is, what is our restoration hope, second, why we need restoration hope, and finally, how we lay hold of restoration hope. So first, what is our restoration hope? Well, the central verse of our passage is really verse 20, and I'm going to paraphrase it again for you. Christ Jesus has been raised, and he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You know, we could spend all day simply unpacking the depths of that single verse. There's so much richness there. But we'll content ourselves with just a few minutes right now. Jesus, fully man, fully God, he went to the cross for our sin. He died and rose again bodily from the grave. That is the historical event that defines our hope as God's people for the present and for the future. But what Jesus' resurrection accomplishes for us, it's bound up in this term, first fruits. First fruits. What that term means for us is that when Jesus rose from the grave after three days in the tomb, that resurrection of his was merely the beginning. It was merely the beginning. He accomplished in that resurrection a victory over death that goes beyond the event of his resurrection. You see, first fruits is a concept that's used several ways in Scripture, and the way it's being used here is imagery. It's meant to paint a picture for you, a, partic- a, a picture uh, in this case of a harvest, a harvest of fruit. Um, and in a harvest of fruit, uh, there are multiple stages. I don't know about many of you, but I grew up going and strawberry picking um, in the spring um, and summer. In fact, it was one day where my mom would say, we're playing hooky from school today, I'm taking you berry picking. And it was just such a wonderful memory, and I probably learned more on those trips than I would have ever from that one day I missed of school. Um, It was a wonderful time with my mom. Um, But anytime you have a, a berry, you go berry picking, it's not like everybody goes one weekend and then it's done. No, it's a season. You have the the first berries that come out, and and you harvest those, and then the plants continue to grow them. We have raspberries in our garden, um, and and there's just a whole whole amount of time where we're having more and more raspberries. It's wonderful. I love raspberries. Um, But you know, the first fruits of a harvest are also not the largest harvest. Um, They're a sign of a greater harvest to come. In other words, first fruits predict future fruits, and the lack of first fruits indicates the lack of future fruit. What this passage says is that Christ Jesus is the first fruits, and we are the later harvest. Paul's saying to the Corinthians, if you say there are no later fruits, there's no later harvest of resurrection, then whether you realize it or not, you're saying there was never a first fruits, that Christ didn't rise. 
If there's no bodily resurrection of believers, there's no, of believers, there's no bodily resurrection of Jesus and no forgiveness of sin. The resurrection of Jesus, his bodily rising from the tomb, is the turning point of human history. But even more amazing are the implications of his resurrection for humanity and the rest of creation. Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead is everything for the people of God. And our hope for our futures is both dependent on his resurrection and patterned on his resurrection. To say it another way, Jesus' bodily resurrection is the model for Christian hope for the future. To drive this home, though, I want to explore what Paul's audience was struggling with. It can be a little bit confusing to understand that, um, looking at 1 Corinthians 15, but I actually think we'll find that it's not all that different from what many Christians think today. Paul says in verse 12 that there were many among the Corinthian church who denied the reality of the resurrection of the dead, of believers being given new bodies and being restored to life as Jesus was. They said, yeah, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but that doesn't mean our bodies are going to rise. It just means that there's spiritual life after death for us. We hope for our souls to live in heaven with God. It's it's the Greek idea that death is the path to a new and better life, shedding the corrupt body for a spiritual existence. You see, they weren't actually denying heaven. They were not denying heaven. They weren't denying what Jesus said to Martha, that the one who believes in me will live even though they die. They accepted the immortality of the soul And they accepted that believers would go to heaven when they died. They simply said, that's it. That's what the story is about. The human story was all about shedding our earthly bodies and going to be with Jesus in heaven. When we as Christians think of our own future, we inevitably think about our own deaths. Death is a reality that we can't escape, and we experience it in small ways and in great ways throughout our lives. As you age and the decline of abilities happen, I can't run anymore because I've, I've lost too much cartilage in one of my knees. I'm only 40, and I already can't go on long runs. Uh, that's, I, it's a small death, but we experience it in big ways, too, as we grieve the loss of loved ones. But many of us, most of us probably in this room today, not only think of our death when we think of the future, but we think of heaven. And that is such a sweet and certain hope. There are times that Paul himself expressed a longing to be done with suffering and to enter God's presence. He said, if I'm away from the body, I am at home with the Lord. You know, I can't think of anything more comforting than the statement of Jesus to the criminal on the cross as they hung next to one another in their last moments of breath, saying, today you will be with me in paradise. What a beautiful promise and hope. But you know, we rarely think beyond that. In a way, it's what I've been trying to drive home each week in this series. And what I've been trying to communicate to you is that our story, the human story, your story, and my story The story of every child of God is linked to the biblical storyline, which starts with creation, um, involves experiencing the corruption of our bodies through the fall in this world, receiving redemption from our sins through Christ, and then looking forward to the promise of restoration when Jesus comes again and makes everything new. That's where the biblical story goes, but that's also where your story goes when you think about your future. The big story of scripture is not about what happens when I die, but what happens when Christ returns in glory. It's not about the destruction of our bodies, but about the renewal of our bodies and receiving glorified bodies. The big story of scripture is not about us going to heaven, but about heaven coming to earth and remaking all things when Jesus comes again. 
That's the beautiful picture we have in Revelation 21. And I almost decided to preach this sermon from that text. It's one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. It points to this beautiful image of that future hope when Jesus comes. And I so appreciate the image, and I think it drives home what I'm trying to say here. There's this scene at the end of history when Jesus comes in glory, and it says that the heavenly city descends to earth. It doesn't say that all of the the people go up to the heavenly city. It says the heavenly city descends. It comes down from heaven. Heaven and earth become one. But we, in thinking about our future hope, we tend to stop again at redemption. And we have no vision for the impact of the gospel on us or our human condition beyond heaven when we die. But that again is not the biblical story. The emphasis of the gospel writers and Paul is on resurrection and restoration. In a very real way, those saints who have gone before us, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, while enjoying rest in the presence of their Savior, they too are looking forward to a day when their restoration will be complete and their souls again given the bodies they were made for, but renewed and made whole. In the passage that follows our text in 1 Corinthians, Paul uses the image of a seed to describe the bodies that we shed at death. But then in the resurrection, it says that that we essentially receive bodies that have grown from that seed, and it's an image um, that I want you to think of. It's, It's like the bodies we will have The difference between what we have now and what we will have then is like the difference between an acorn and an oak tree. The same thing, but so tremendously different in glory. Dutch theologian Herman Bavink, um, who's my personal favorite theologian, uh, lived during the time of Teddy Roosevelt. He wrote on this hope, although believers upon their death immediately become sharers of the heavenly blessedness according to their soul. Still their condition is, in a certain sense, a preliminary one and a still imperfect one. Jumping ahead in verse 20 of our passage, their dying is called sleeping. But since Christ is the perfect Savior, he is not content with the redemption of the soul, but also affects the redemption of the body. It's like what I said a few weeks ago in our discussion of gender and what it means to be made male and female. We are our bodies, and our bodies are good. The Savior we worship is not the Savior of the sweet by and by, but the Savior who dives into our mess, brings new life to us, and will return again to make it new. He is the one who says at the end of this book, at the end of the book of Revelation, behold, I am coming soon and my reward is with me. Brothers and sisters, in heaven as on the earth, there is still a longing for future glory, for the end of the story, a yearning for when Christ will reign supreme with death fully under his feet, when he will come in power and make all things new, giving his children resurrected, glorified bodies in a renewed and restored world to enjoy. That is the Christian hope. At this point, you could be forgiven for thinking, why does all this matter? Isn't all this just curiosity? Speculative theology about the future? Shouldn't you, pastor, be giving me advice on how to live now, not hope for the sweet by and by that's irrelevant to today? Well, I want you to know that this isn't merely about intellectual curiosity. I'm not interested in preaching useless sermons. There's no, you know, there, there's a reason that Paul spent this massive chapter talking about how you must believe in the resurrection of our bodies. There's a reason Paul is so emphatic, and it's because of this one simple principle I want to give you and I want you to remember. There is nothing that more greatly impacts how you live now than what you believe about the future. 
There is nothing that more impacts how you live now than what you believe about the future. And that's why we come, where we come to why we need this restoration hope. Coming back to the slave spiritual that I quoted at the beginning, my soul longs for something new, for something new. There's been an on-again and off-again criticism of songs like this that emerged from American slavery. In academia, um, that these slave spirituals, which, which expressed such a longing for eternity, uh, for Jesus to right all wrongs and make everything new, that somehow they made slaves docile and submissive, that it subdued the longing for freedom and temporal justice. That's the criticism you'll get in academia. In the 1940s, there was an African-American scholar um, named Howard Thurman. He wrote that this was anything but the truth. You, you read what he said, and you, you find that he's almost offended by this. He said, what greater tribute could be paid to the slave's religious faith than this? It taught a people how to ride high to life. To look squarely in the face of those facts that argue most dramatically against all hope. And to use those facts as the raw material out of which they fashioned hope that the environment with all of its cruelty could not crush. It was hope in Jesus' promise of resurrection, of ultimate justice against evil and oppression, of restoration that enabled them to endure. And without that hope, there was no endurance. He went on to say, theirs was a sung faith, which enabled them to reject annihilation and to affirm a terrible right to live. In other words, what their songs, like the one I quoted from, affirmed about the future, what they believed about a savior who promised them the more that their souls longed for, this is what anchored their hope through injustice and suffering and enabled them to continue without despair. And hope to experience God's goodness now and in the life to come. This is the first reason why knowing what our hope for the future is, is so important. Even crucial for how we are to live. It's why Paul says that those whose hope is only for this life are most of all to be pitied. Brothers and sisters, you and I will each, we will all encounter grief and sorrow. We will all encounter the failure and corruption of our bodies. Do we have no hope? when we encounter wrongs and pains in this world that cannot be undone, do we have no hope? Is our answer to be the jaded and materialistic response of accepting that, well, life is pain. Anyone else is selling something. That's what they said in The Princess Bride. <laughs> is what we experience all that there is or is our hope merely for an escape? Merely for an escape from the pain to an immaterial eternity. In other words, well, my suffering doesn't matter because I'm going to shed this body and move on to something better. Is that what our hope is? No. It is right to hope for that escape. We hope for that. But more than that, our hope is that our sorrows matter. That the suffering you and I have experienced matters to God. And that he cares enough about it. And he sees it enough to promise that you are going to be made whole again. That there is hope beyond the grave for the sufferings we've endured. And that our Savior Jesus in making all things new, in wiping every tear from our eye, as Revelation 21 says, we'll also make right every wrong. For how can my tears be gone if the injustices and losses I have experienced and seen are not repaired, not restored? Did Jesus merely console Martha and Mary when Lazarus died? 
with the hope that, yeah, in the sweet by and by, he's fine now, he's in a better place. Is that what he did? He just consoled them with immaterial spiritual existence in the future. No. He wept because death is not what we were made for. Our bodies, like our souls, were made for eternity. And they were made for glory. And then he called him out of the tomb. That is Christian hope. Displaying in advance his plan to right all wrongs. That is why we do not have to despair, church, when we encounter suffering and grief we cannot resolve. Because Jesus is raised. Amen? Because Jesus' resurrection is but the first fruits of God's ultimate victory over death, sin, and evil. The works of death will not last and they will be undone such that those who trust in Christ will experience no lack nor any sense of sorrow or loss when Jesus hands over the kingdom to his father and we are raised to new life in him. That's the kind of hope that fueled those who endured the abuses of slavery that fueled them for a life of endurance in faith. And if it could fuel them, can't it fuel us for the same? Should it not do the same for us? But not only should it help us endure suffering faithfully, it should also help us work hard with joy. I included the last verse of 1 Corinthians 15 with our text because I think it sums up the argument Paul makes in the whole chapter about the implications of our resurrection hope. He says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor, (coughs) excuse me, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The promise of resurrection life means that our work in our bodies matters. It has eternal significance. You know, there's this horrible idea that many of us might have when things go wrong. Perhaps you've heard it. A Christian will often say in such a situation, well, it doesn't really matter. It's all going to burn anyway. Perhaps you've said that or perhaps you've heard it. It's a fatalistic statement, which even though it's intended to say, you know what, the things I have aren't the most important things. That's a good idea. I think there are better ways to express it. Because it's a fatalistic statement which denies the value and goodness of creation, of physical creation. It's a way of saying that this world does not matter and what we do will not last or endure. Because heaven is our home, not the earth. But here Paul says that because of the resurrection, work done in the Lord is not in vain. And this doesn't just refer to Christian ministry, like me, what I do. No, it refers to everyday labor as well, whether in business, in parenting, in teaching, in healthcare, whatever you do. It all matters and is made significant by the fact, uh, for for two reasons. Um, One, by the fact that everyone we interact with, everyone we work with, everyone we love was made for eternity. But it is only through faith in Christ that we will experience that eternity whole and restored. But second, the other reason what we do matters, you know, there's a great picture again at the end of the story in Revelation of the kings of the earth bringing their treasures in to the heavenly city. That is such a strange image because I wonder, what are they bringing in? What are they bringing in? What could they add possibly to God's heavenly city? Well, the way I look at that is it's a, it's a picture of God incorporating the good of our work in this world into his new creation. I don't know what that means and looks like, but I do know that it affirms the value of what we do in the Lord in this life. The cry of the psalmist is, establish the work of our hands, Lord. And the hope of resurrection, the hope of restoration, is that yes, he will. 
What you do in your bodies matters. And in God's economy of all things, it has eternal implications. So work with all your heart. In the Lord, it will not be in vain. It's here that we come to the very last thing I have for you today. How to lay hold of this hope. We've looked at what our hope in Christ is and why we need it. Now I want you to leave you in this whole series with how to lay hold of it. And it's a simple message. The first is by belonging to him. In verse 23 of our text, it says that the way we join in the benefits of Christ's resurrection is by belonging to him. It is those who belong to him who are raised, glorified like him. You know, I love this phrase. I love this phrase, belonging to Jesus, for it reminds me that faith in Jesus isn't merely affirming facts about Jesus. It's not merely saying, yes, I believe that Jesus died and rose again, and that's good news for me because it it, it pays for sin, and then it stays at arm's length. It says we belong to him. Faith is a living union with the risen Savior. True faith not only forgives our sins by God's grace, but it connects us in relationship to the one who redeemed us, who is bodily resurrected and reigning in heaven now. The one who redeemed us and makes us part of his body, the church. Do you belong to Jesus? Do you belong to him? It is only in him that we have the opportunity to experience the life that we were designed for. It is only in him that we have the invitation to taste and see the more that our souls long for. It is only in him that we see we have a God who has experienced our sorrow and death, endured the cost in himself to bring everyone who trusts in him to new life, even as he experiences it. Do you belong to Jesus? In him alone is life. Do not leave here today without asking yourself that question. And if you don't know the answer, ask somebody sitting near you. Ask them to pray with you. There is nothing I want more for you than to be able to answer that question, yes, I belong to him. Finally, what it looks like to lay hold of our resurrection hope is also that we begin to live as a community in light of God's resurrection and restoration plan. We live as he designed us to live, not as the world has made us. You see, the picture at the end of the story presents a paradigm for what the church is to be in the world. It's what the church is and why the letter of 1 Corinthians is so loaded with calling the Corinthian church to faith to unity, and to repentance. As the church, we are to be an outpost of God's restored humanity, displaying the resurrection life of Jesus in our community by our love for one another, by our repentance and forgiveness, by our loving union with people who are different from us across the divides that separate us in the world. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, we are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free. And as we embody God's restored order of things to a world in need of his resurrection hope, we can be certain that our work in the Lord is not in vain. To be so heavenly minded is of immense earthly good. What are you hoping in, church? What are you longing for? Jesus has been raised, and if you hope in him, you will be raised to glory too. Let the hope of resurrection be your fuel for a life of following Jesus, and never lose that longing for him to 
make all things new, for him to be the more that your souls long for. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Help us to hope in him and to look forward with longing for the day when we too and this whole world you have made will be made new. Until that day, Lord, help us to live as your children, as citizens of your kingdom, displaying in our life together your excellency to a world that needs more. In Jesus' name, amen.